I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to start talking about functions. So, uh, here, let me. Module 5 is about functions, and functions are a wonderful thing. Why are they wonderful? Because of reusability. We found out last week how much I love the topic of reusability. And we're going to continue down that path today. So what are we doing? Okay, the same principles apply as last week. We're not copying and pasting. We're actually reducing the amount of code we write because we're reusing our code. But this week, we give it a name. So like we name variables, we're going to name functions. And instead of like a variable holds a value, a function is going to hold a set of Python code. That's what it does. It, it holds that set, and we can call it by name, and we can give it data, and it can give us back data. So this is really the beginning of data-driven code. Our, our loops did that some last week. But and what do I mean by data-driven code? What I mean is when I pass, a, when I have some number of lines of code, doesn't matter how many they are, if I give that code one set of data, it should be able to process that data and come out with a correct answer. And if we take a non-code example, let's just take simple addition, okay? If I use the plus operator and I say 2 plus 2, well, the answer is always going to be 4. But if I give it different data, if I say 3 plus 3, the answer is 6. So the answer is correct even when I give it different data. And so that's what we have to do this week. So we've got some new things to learn. Okay, we've got some keywords to learn. We're going to talk about arguments. We're going to talk about returns. We're going to talk about why Python is special in that case. But we have to start with the basics. So the basics of a function are the def keyword. Def is the keyword that tells Python, we're not going to execute this code. Anything that's in the code block associated with this function don't execute it right now. Execute it later when someone asks you to execute it. So that's what the keyword does. And when we get into PyCharm, what we will do is I'll show you what kind of that means in a more concrete matter. Then I have the name of the function. That's all it is. It's a name. Just like a variable is a name, a function is a name. The same rules about naming kind of apply. You can't like start with a number or that you can't use any character you want. It's basically alphanumeric with an underscore. So, but it's just a name. There's nothing magical in the name. Then you have the code block itself. The code block is only executed when someone later on in the code makes a call to the function using its name. So this function's name is print pattern. And later on in the code, when I call print pattern, then it will execute this. But otherwise, it's storing. Def tells Python to store this code for later use. And then we have the parentheses. Parentheses are very important here. Again, as with everything to do with parentheses in Python, the parentheses have to be balanced. So you have to have an opening, uh, opening left parenthesis and a closing right parenthesis. And as always, because we're dealing with code blocks, we have to have a colon. If you don't end with a colon, everything's still going to be wrong. So. A function declaration is always started with def. If you don't start it with def, you don't have a function definition. You have to have the parentheses. Okay, so here is part two of 
How do I call a function? Well, I just told you that I define it, but the def word says, hold this back, put this in storage. Well, I call it by using its name. And in this case, I have to use it with just an open parenthesis and a closed parenthesis. So later on in the code, I will call print pattern and print, the print pattern function will be executed. Um, you always have to define a function before you use it. Unlike some languages like um, Java, you can, you know, you can define a function and call a function and the order doesn't matter. Order matters in Python. It has to be defined before it can be called. Or po sorry, or Python is going to tell you that it doesn't exist. So this is a function call. The function call is the name. Okay. When I call a function, I actually go into the function and execute the function. So in this case, when I call print pattern, I'm going to get five stars. And I can call it again. I can call as many times as I want. I'm going to call print pattern again. It's, Python's going to go up. It's going to do the print pattern. And I'm going to print out another set of stars. So when I said I can reuse code, that means I can reuse code. I can use print pattern as many times as I want. I'm not writing the same line of code again and again. Now, why is this important? What if the print pattern needed to change? What if I only wanted to use hash signs rather than stars? Do I want to go through every place in the code where I've got five stars and replace that with five hashes? Or do I want to put the pattern in a function called print pattern and then I only change it in one place? I only change the stars to hashes and it works. So that's one of the powers of functions. So let's see, do I have a part three? Must be defined before use. You got to call it by a name. Um, the calling the function in Python tells Python to run the code. So let's go out and we're going to take a look at 511. Okay. So here's the code. Looks very simple. Um, I have def print pattern, and in there I just have a print statement. And then down here I decided, well, I want to be a, I I want to be a little loopy because I learned about loops last week, and I want to you know practice with them. So I have four i in range two called print pattern. So we're going to run this through the debugger, and I've put two breakpoints. I put a breakpoint on line three, and I put a breakpoint on line six. And the reason I did that is because I want you to see that we don't stop at line three when Python starts up. The first line that we're going to hit is line six. And that's because def is telling Python to take everything associated with the name print pattern and store it. So let's do this. Let me edit the configuration real quick. 511, where'd it go? There we are. OK, so I'm going to debug this. And we see that the first line of code it stopped at was 6. It did not execute line 3. And it didn't execute line 3 because it is inside a function. The only time that will get executed, and I'm going to step over here, uh, is when I call print pattern. So now I'm calling print pattern, and it's going to output that line because I, it executed it. I told it to execute line three by calling print pattern by name. So I now go up. I'm at one, I call print pattern, and I print out more stars. And now I'm done. Now let's say that I didn't want the pattern just to be stars. Let's say I wanted 
the pattern to be stars and then to be hashes. Let's just do that. Now the only thing I have changed is I've added a line, I've added line four. And I've added line four inside the function. It's inside the block that is the function. So if I run this again, what I'm going to see is stars and hashes, stars and hashes. Now if we expand this thought and we say print pattern can be called anywhere in my code. Maybe I want to have a certain kind of line break in my game that tells people that they've made, that they've moved, or that there are new items available. I can put that in a print pattern function, and if I decide stars don't give it the kind of oomph I want, then I can change them to hashes. Um, the other nice thing is I can call it as many times as I want. So that is kind of what a pattern, uh, sorry, a function definition does. It takes all of this and it stores it. And then you can call it. Now this is a simple example, but I use functions all the time. I, I bread and butter is loops and functions. Um, I write functions all the time. I like functions. I like functions because I can take a concept and I can break it down into its component pieces and when those component pieces are related and they need to be data driven, I can put them in something that's named and I can call it. And it's a great way of organizing your code. So, anybody have any questions? Nope. Okay, so that's only the very beginning. What we just saw is the very, very beginning part of functions. Now what we have is we have extra stuff. So we talked about def. Now we're going to talk about things in between those parentheses. So I still have the def. It's define a function. So Python will take everything that is inside the code block of the function, which means it's after the def and it is indented and um, it's going to store it. So now I have my function name, it's called print total inches, all good. Now in between the parentheses I have these two things and they're called parameters. A parameter is a private variable that is associated with the function. It's only valid within the code block of the function, which means that's the only time it can be used. If we use it outside the code block, we're going to have, it, it's not going to behave the way we want. And it allows me as a programmer to send data into this function to be acted upon because Input, process, output. Well, a function is all about process. Okay, you are creating a function to take some process and encapsulate it and give it a name. So, num, in this case, num feet and num inches are parameters. All parameters are separated by a comma. You can have as many parameters as you want. They cannot be named the same. Each parameter has to be uniquely named. So then I have the code block, which is inside the function. Just like last week we had inside the loop and outside the loop, this week we have inside the function and outside the function. Again, Python is a space delimited language. So we know it's inside the function because it is indented at least one after the line with the def. So after the function definition line. And um, the parameter is a variable that exists only inside the function. Now, up until now, we have talked about, you know, saying the left, I know it's a function because it's on the left hand side of a single equal sign. I've said that a lot. But this changes the paradigm a bit. 
because there's no left-hand side of the single equal sign here. And that's because with functions, when you want to pass in data, you have to give them a place for Python to put that piece of data. And that's why we don't have them explicitly, at least not yet, with an equal sign. So this is the exception to the rule when it comes to variable definitions. It applies to functions, to all functions, and it can cause, uh, especially new students, kind of to trip up a bit because the concept, because we're changing the paradigm of what a function is, or sorry, what a variable definition looks like. Okay. The value of a parameter is provided by the function call. So here is a little bit more detailed part of that program. So this is just challenge 5.2.3. And basically, we're defining a function. Um, it's going to have two parameters, num feet and num inches, that print the total number of inches. Note they're 12 inches in a foot. OK. So what do I have here first? What I have here first is I have, oh, shouldn't have hit the enter key yet. I have the function definition already set up. Your good professor Lisa here is going to enter, there's a num feet equal int input and a num inches equal int input. So I'm going to say 5 and 8. And then I'm going to call the function print total inches. So when I call the function print total inches, num feet is 5 and num inches is 8. So 5 is going to now be the value of num feet in the print total inches function. And 8 is going to be the value of the variable num inches in the print total inches function. So what happens is that um, num feet times 12 plus num inches, which is 8, is going to print out 68. That's perfect. So now, an argument value, uh, argument is a value that is passed into a function. So, I didn't write that well. Um, num feet and num inches in the print total inches function call are what they're what what are called arguments, and those are just the data that's getting passed in. Most of the time, it's a function name, but it doesn't have to be. It could simply be a value. Okay, a function call has to have the same number of arguments as parameters in the function definition. So the def definition, the def line with print total inches, has two parameters num feet and num inches, which means that print total inches the function call, which is the last line of code on this slide, it needs to have two arguments. The number of parameters and the number of arguments have to match most of the time. There'll be, we'll, we'll find out a way in a little bit where you can kind of make it easier for somebody using your code um, with default argument. Um, but for right now, the call, the number of arguments in the call has to match the number of um, parameters in the function call. Okay. Argument order. Argument order doesn't matter. You, you don't automatically get order. Um, functions are passed by value. So that means that if I change num inches and num feet, my calculation is going to change. So again, Professor Lisa is going to enter 5, and she's going to enter 8. 5 is num feet. 8 is num inches. When I make this function call, num feet is the second parameter. So it's going to be the value of num inches when I call the function. And num inches is the first uh, argument. So that means num feet, the parameter in uh, print total inches, is going to be 8, which means my calculation is going to change. Because instead, I'm going to have num feet, 
still the variable num feed in the function, and I'm going to say 8 times 12, and then num inches is now 5, and I'm going to add plus 5, so I will print out 101. So the only thing that happened is I changed the order of the arguments in the call to print to print total inches. That's the only thing that happened. Nothing else changed, but the outcome of print total inches changed because I switched the order. So that's called pass by value. So the actual value of the first argument, doesn't matter what the name is, is the first the, the value of the first parameter in the function call. The value of the second argument is always the value of the second parameter in the function call. So it doesn't matter the name of the argument. It's completely irrelevant. It's the value that that argument is holding, that that variable is holding. Um, Okay, so let's go and take a look at 523. Okay, so 523. And I want to I do a little error stuff here too. So first of all, this is pretty much what we saw on the screen. I have the definition of the function. I know that those two lines are inside the function because they are indented at least one. This is a function call. This is a function call with the argument order switched. But before I run it, let's look at a few things. First of all, what happens if I do that? All of a sudden, I get all this red all over my screen. Why in the world do I do that? Why in the world, sorry, does Python do that? Well, Python is a space-delimited language. The only way that it knows that something is inside the function block is to, it, it has to be indented one, just like loops have to be indented one for us to know that it's inside the loop. To know that it's inside the function, it has to be indented at least once. So I've indented it once. That's lines 5, 6, and 7 make up the function call. Sorry, make up the body of the function, and it's what Python is going to store for later use. Now, my favorite colon. What happens if I don't have a colon? If I don't have a colon, I get more red. And if I run this, sorry, let me change that. Five, two, three. Oops. Five, two, three. If I run this without that colon, I'm going to get an invalid syntax. And luckily, this is one of those times when Python is actually going to tell me exactly where the problem is. So in this case, the problem is that there's no colon after num inches. And because I didn't actually demonstrate what's, what the function, sorry, what the error will be, I'm going to back this up and I'm going to run it. So here I get my indentation error. Now we saw this last week, an indentation error is just that. Python is telling you something is not indented properly. If I look at my code, I can see, whoops, I did not indent that at least one. So Python doesn't know that it's inside of a function, and Python's just going to kind of throw up its hands and say, I'm sorry, I don't know what to do. So if we run this, and I'm going to put a great point at six, just so that we remember that Python is storing line six. It's not going to call it right away. And then I also have a breakpoint at line nine. So if I debug this, I don't, line six does not get hit. The first line that's going to be executed 
is num feet and I'm just going to input num feet. So I'm going to step over this and I'm going to input num feet and let's say num feet is 4. And now I'm going to input num inches. Let's say it's 2. Oops, step over. So I have 4 and 2. So I'm going to call print total inches with the parameters 4 and 2. So now I am inside my print total inches function. I'm going to do the calculation. So I'm going to get a total inches of 50 and I'm going to print out 50. Now the next thing I'm going to do and the only change here is that num inches and num feet have been swapped. I have not touched anything in the print total inches function. So I'm going to step over. I'm back here. Now num feet is 2 and num inches is 4. So num inches is the value is 4 and it's passed by value. So that means num feet becomes, sorry, did I do that wrong? Num inches is 4 and num feet is 2. I got that wrong. It's passed by reference. I'm sorry. Uh, it's been a long day. It's been a long several days. So we get num feet is 2 and num inches is 4 and I get 28. So yeah. No, it's passed by value. I apologize. I apologize. It's passed by value. My brain, I apologize. I've been working way, way too much. Um, we're about to get a release out, so I apologize. Anyway, it's passed by reference. It's pa sorry, it's passed by value. Okay. Let me get back on track. Okay. So we've got data into a function. Now we're going to figure out how to get data out. So there's input, process, output. Input is the um, parameters. Process is whatever you do with them. And output is a return statement. So we, we have our def keyword. We're going to store a function called pyramid volume. We have three parameters this time, base length, base width, and pyramid height. And then I have two lines of code that are inside the function block. That's the code block. I have a new keyword. The new keyword is called return. And it tells Python to return whatever value I want it to return. In this case, I'm returning the value of the variable pyramid. So pyramid, I'm, um, you know, making a calculation, and then I want that value to be sent back to whoever called because they want to use it for some reason. So a return is used exclusively inside a function block. Okay, returns are are, are there for functions. So if I now look at challenge 533, I have my definition of pyramid, which Python's going to store, and then I'm going to enter some values, and I'm going to then call pyramid volume, and I'm going to give it length, width, length, width, and height, and I'm going, I'm going to get something back. So what I'm going to get back when I call it is I'm going to get back a variable I'm calling pyramid. You know it's a variable. It's on the left hand side of a function. Now this is the first time we have called a function from, with a variable on the left hand side. So this is telling me when I read the code that I'm expecting something to be given back to me from the function 
pyramid volume. So here I am, I'm putting in 4.5, I'm putting in 2.1, and I'm putting in 3.0. So I get 4.5 as the length, 2.1 as the width, and 3.0 as the height. So those are my three arguments. And I have three parameters, so everything's going to work fine. Length becomes base, base length. Again, the name of the argument and the name of the parameter can be whatever you want, and they don't have to match because we're passing by value. So width is going to be base width, and height is going to be pyramid height. So my function is going to take in 4.5, 2.1, and 3.0. And then I'm going to do the calculation. And the calculation is base length times base width, base width times pyramid height times 1.0 divided by 3.0 is going to give me my pyramid. So my calculation ends up being 9.45. And now I have this return statement with the variable pyramid to the right of it. Return is going to say, hey, send this value back to whoever called me. And that's what it's going to do. Now, we're expected as programmers to have a place to put that. The place to put that is the pyramid variable. And so pyramid now has the value of 4.5. And then it's going to do its printout. So you're going to call a function by using its name and providing arguments. Always remember to define a variable before the function call to be used with the return value. So um, what was I going to say? Sorry. So on the left-hand side, you can have a variable name. And on the right-hand side, you can have a function call, as long as that function call is going to return something. OK, so I'm going to go to do 5.3.3 real quick. 5.3.3. Okay, so here we have our pyramid um, our pyramid function, or pyramid volume function. So I've got my um, breakpoints just to continue to let you guys know what's going on. And I have my return keyword. It's going to say now pass this outside of the function. Because right now pyramid only exists. When I am at line 6 and uh, line 7, pyramid only exists within the function. And the name of the return variable doesn't matter. They do not have to be the same. So what I've done here is I've put xxx. So if I debug this, it's, um, OK. So I'm going to input the length. Let's just do two. I'm going to input the height. Why isn't it? It didn't debug it. Hold on. Stop. There we go. Let's debug again. I'm going to stop here. Sorry. Stop and rerun. OK, there we go. My apologies. I did not have that debugger in the right place. So the first thing I'm going to do is enter my length. And then I'm going to enter my width. And then I'm going to enter my height. And now I'm going to call pyramid volume. So in this case, I'm going to step in. Now, this is part of the debugger that we haven't used in PyCharm yet. But what step in does is it says, 
I know that you're about to use a function, so I want you to step inside that function and show me what's going on. So we're going to step inside the function, and I'm going to step over. Now we can see up here in PyCharm that base length is 2, base width is 3, and pyramid height is 4. And so that's what my calculations are going to be. I'm going to step over that, and now I'm going to return pyramid. So pyramid is 8, and that's going to be my return value. So when I step over that, and then I finish the execution, you'll know right, notice right now if I go to variables, there's no XXX yet. XXX hasn't been created, and it hasn't been created because I haven't actually executed line 12. When I execute line 12, I have XXX, and it is 8.0. So by calling pyramid volume, I was able to do a calculation, and then I was able to get a value back that was the result of that calculation, and then I can print it out. Now, I could change this in any number of ways. I could call this in a loop. Um, one of the things you're going to have to do very soon is you're going to have to write pseudocode for a couple of different functions, like get item. So you have to think about what the process is when you're getting an item. And then you want to write those lines of code and name it, put it in something that's named, like get item. Um, a few things, a few more uh, fun things here is that if I do this and I try and run this, I'm going to do 2, 4, 6 this time, I get an error. Now, the error is not a syntax error. I, Python's not going to go out and say, oh, wait a minute, pyramid volume has three parameters and you only gave me two arguments. That's only going to happen at runtime. And that's what this is saying. Pyramid volume, missing one required optional argument pyramid height. So what it's telling you is that it only caught the issue after it made the function call. Because what Python did is it said, okay, I got one, two arguments. I'm going to make this the first argument, the value for the first argument. I'm going to get this the value for the second argument. But wait a minute, there's no value for the third. There's no matching argument. So that is one type of um, exception you're going to run into when you start writing functions if you don't count up the parameters and the arguments. They have to match. So let's stop. Oh, it stopped. Okie dokie. Um, Python objects. And we're going to talk about this a little now, and then we're going to talk about it more later. We're really starting to talk about the process of encapsulation. Encapsulation basically just means I'm drawing a line around it. And I'm going to put this code in a box with a name. Now, this box with a name right now is a function, but in week eight, it's going to be an object. Um, and so, and a function in Python is actually an object. An object has three things. It has a type, it has an identity, and it has a value. Okay? A function is an object, and everything in Python, everything that Python gives you is really an object, even though we don't treat them like a, a, a user-defined object, pretty much everything in Python is an object. Um, hold on. Went the wrong way. Okay. Okay. So, let's take a look at our pyramid volume. The function name gives it identity. The parameters give it a value, and the return, the type 
of the return value is the type of the function. So those are the three things that are required for an object, and a function has them. It has an identity, it has a value, and it has a type. We always have to remember that the, the type is the return, the value of the returned variable or variables. And we're going to see how to do that in just a moment. So let's talk about scope. And I always, I always think, should I introduce this earlier or should I not? Because um, scope is a concept that most programming languages have. And we really care about two. We care about the local scope and the global scope. Weeks one and weeks two were all about global scope. The minute we hit week three and we started to have to indent for, um, for branching, we started to get into the local scope. Loops are definitely have local scope. And functions are all about local scope. Because what exists inside of a function, a parameter, sorry, a value that exists inside of a function will not exist necessarily outside the function. You will get lots of errors if you don't mentally draw your line around that. So a bit more about scope. Here we have our pyramid. And um, the function name is in the global scope until we get to objects. But for this week and up to week eight, all function names are in the global scope, which means you can get to them from anywhere in your program. The parameters are in the local scope, which means you can only validly access them from inside the um, from inside the function. The process that we see here, this pyramid equal base length, is the local scope and it is inside the function. The return statement is also in the local scope, but it makes a value that was previously only available in the local scope available in the global scope. The function call can be in any scope. Right now it's in the global scope, but we could call a function from another function, and that function call would be inside of a local scope. So there are no restrictions based on scope for where you can call a function. And then the arguments that we are using to pass into the function, they can be available from the global scope. And in this case, we're making them available from the global scope to the local scope. However, if you call the function from inside of a function, you would then be call making something from one local scope available to something from another local scope. Sounds like a lot of gobbledygook, but it is important to understand scope as we move through what's going on, because you'll get errors otherwise. So um, let me, let me, I'm going to go back to 533 for just a second, and I'm going to demonstrate scope a little bit. So I'm up here. I've got my def for my pyramid, OK? And I want to just print pyramid. I just want to print that. So all I want to do, I added a quick line. That's it. But I have a red squiggly. And it says unresolved reference pyramid. But I see pyramid at line 7. Why in the world can't I get to the value of pyramid from line 12? I can see it here. I can see it on line 6 where I assign it. It's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Why can't I get to it? You cannot get to it from line 12 because line 12 is in the global scope. Lines 9 through 15 are in the global scope. They are completely left justified. And 
That's the way they should be. The difference is that these two lines of code are not in the global scope. They are in the local scope. They only exist while Python is inside this function. After that, they go away. Everything gets blanked out. Python goes back and it puts pyramid volume on the shelf until we call it again. And then the pyramid variable will be resurrected and we will be able to put a value in it and return that value. So this is in the global scope. This is in the local scope. And without doing something special, never the twain shall meet. Sorry. Okay. So, what did I miss? Okay. Arguments and mutability. So, um, we want to... Okay, we're going to swap values. We have values here, good things, just and all. And I'm going to pass those in. I'm going to split them. I'm going to, um, sorry. I am inputting here, comma, good, comma, things, comma, just, comma, end, comma, all. I'm splitting that into a list and I'm sending it up into a function I've called called swap because I want to swap things around. So when I swap things around, when I'm all done, I'm going to get all good things just end here. And when I print values, I'm going to get all good things just end here. And that is because I am dealing with a value that is mutable. A list is mutable. And I can, in fact, change um, the value of a list from inside the function to outside the function. Because this is, that we're passing for the list, we're not passing the value, we're passing the reference to the value. So we're passing an address, a place in memory for this list. And when we change the list in the function, we're going to change the list everywhere. So if an argument is mutable, then any changes made to the value in the local scope will reflect in the global scope. Now notice I said if an argument is mutable. A string is not mutable. A string is immutable. So if I passed a single string into swap, it wouldn't have mattered. If I could have made all the changes in the world inside that function and the string would be the exact same thing in the global scope. It would not change. But a list is mutable. A list can be changed. So any changes I make in the local scope are reflected in the global scope. So I didn't have to return anything here to realize the outcome of the swap. And I hope that I hope that's kind of clear. Okay. So let's go back and do five one two one. Have I lost you guys tonight, or do you are you are you okay so far with what's going on? I always worry when I start talking about functions that I lose. That's where I start to really lose people. So I'd like to hear from you if this is making sense, because if not, I really want it to make sense. Oops. Okay. Thank you for telling me that you're following. Good. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. So for 5121, here we have our little swap, and we're going to do this, and 
5121. Okay. So I am going to debug because I, I love the debugger. And I'm going to go to the console. And right now I say values equals input dot split. So I'm going to say um, dog my Millie is. Okay. So what happened? Enter. Let's start that again. Okay. I'm going to debug this again. I'm at values. I'm going to step over in the console. I'm going to say dog my is. Hit the enter key. There we go. I must have hit the wrong key. So I've done an input with a string with commas. I've split it based on a comma. And now my value is a list. So a list is mutable. A list can be changed, which means I can use this property of mutability so that I don't necessarily have to return something. So what happens in the local scope is going to be reflected in the global scope. So now I am going to step into, that's this little arrow here, I'm going to step into the swap function. And I've created a temp variable, and I'm going to take the first element from that, and I'm going to remove it. And then I'm going to remove, I'm going to take the last element and replace it. So when I look at variables, I only have a single list to swap. There is no list, there's not two lists to swap here because there's not a difference between the one in the local scope and the one in the global scope. So if I step over, I'm now going to have is my Millie dog. And then I'm going to print it. So the change that was made in the local scope is being made in the global scope, and I didn't have to return anything. I would have had to return something if it had been a string. Because the string is not mutable. Okie dokie. Argument mutability, default parameters. I know we've got, we're going through a lot of stuff tonight. Um, default parameter values. Remember that when I said that your argument, the number of arguments and the number of parameters have to match? Well, not always. The reason they don't always have to match is because you can have what are called default parameter values. So, and a default parameter value is just that. If somebody doesn't pass in anything, use this as the default. Why do we want to do that? Well, because sometimes it can make it easier to call a function. Um, sometimes um, it, we want to make sure that we know what the absolute default value is so that our code doesn't break. But mostly it's just to make it easier for people to call a function. I don't necessarily, if I've got 10 arguments, if I've got 10 arguments, I really need to refactor things. But if I have a lot of arguments, and a lot of parameters, the code can get messy. And that nobody has to remember that the default value should be zero. So if I have number of pennies, and I'm calling this in a 100 different places in my code, and I realize down the road that it's a bug, that the, def that the, the minimum pennies, the default pennies, shouldn't be zero. It should be one. But if I'm relying, I'm the writer of this function, if I'm relying on everybody else to, to remember that the default pennies is zero, if they don't have any pennies, then 
the default has to be zero. It can't be negative one, it can't be one, it has to be zero. If I realize somewhere down the road that I was wrong and the default pennies has to be one, do I want to go find every place in the code that is calling default pen, that's calling number of pennies and change that second argument to one if it's zero? Or do I want to do it in one place? This is again code reusability and making your code more maintainable. And that's really what a default parameter value does. Okay? If if all else, if, if nobody passes anything in for that, then I'm going to make it some value. And that's very helpful because you change it in fewer places. The fewer places you have to change the code, the less fragile your code is and the more usable it is. So how do I define a default parameter value? Well, it has to be done in the same line as the function. It is done as part of creating the parameter and what it does is a parameter is a variable. We already got that. So because it's a variable, it can be on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And in this case, in the way this is defined, what's on the right-hand side of the single equal sign is the default value. So that's the, that's the only difference. We've seen other functions defined. In this case, our second parameter has a default value of zero. That's how you read this. Now, one thing you have to remember is default valued parameters can only be, can only exist after non-default valued parameters. So they have to be at the end of the parameter list. So if I am entering the number four and I'm just going to call number of pennies with the number four. Okay, I don't have two arguments here. I have a single argument and it is the value, the result of an input statement. I don't have to have two arguments here because I have the default parameter value. So four is the number of dollars. Zero is the number of pennies because that's the default value. So four times 100 plus zero is 400 and that's what's going to get printed out. So I'm going to print number of pennies with two inputs now. I just called it with one. Now I'm calling it with two. So I'm going to put five as the first value and six as the second value. And then five becomes dollars. Six becomes pennies because I am passing in an argument. It doesn't stay the default. If I have two arguments and two parameters, even if one of the parameters has a default, it doesn't matter. The argument value always overrides the default. And so I'm going to do my calculation, and it's going to be 506, and that's what I'm going to print. So any function parameter can have a default value that will be used if an argument is not available. The function parameter has a default value. The function call does not need to include an argument with that value. Sorry, with an argument for that parameter. Okay, they have to, the default parameters have to be listed in the function definition after all parameters without defaults. So, multiple returns. This is one of, the, one of the few languages that has this, and it is a very wonderful tool to have. Why is it? Because in most languages, you can only return a single value from a function. In Python, you can return as many values from a function as you want. It doesn't matter. In Java, if I were going to do this, I would have to create a structure, and that structure would then be used to return both, you know, two values or three values or however many values I needed it to return. Python, I don't have to create an artificial structure. Python will simply just return the values 
as their position. So here we have a move it function. And we're going to move the second element from list 1 to list 2, and then move the second element from list 2 to list 1, and return both lists and output the results. So I have, I'm going to call move it with 1, 2, 3, a list called 1, 2, 3, and a list called 4, 5, 6. So this is a general swap, so I'm going to say temp is the value of list 1, List one, the first value of list one is list is the first value in list two, and the um, temp is going to become the the sorry that should have been list two of one. My bad. And then on the next line, I'm going to return list one and list two. So I'm returning two values, list one and list two, and you will see. On the left-hand side of the function call move it, there is an L1 and an L2. And those are two variable names. And on the right-hand side of that single equal sign, the function is expected to return two values. And they're positional, so L1 will be the first return value, and L2 will be the second. So. L1 is going to be 153, L2 is going to be 426, and I'm going to print L1, which is 153, and I'm going to print L2, which is 426. Return values are positional. Okay? There is no you, there is no name matching, nothing like that. They are strictly positional. The first position of uh, a return value goes to the first variable defined for that return. And the second one goes to the second. And you can have as many of these as you want. Now, my suggestion if you're a programmer and um, you're writing in Python, if you're going to have a large number of return values, you should either think of restructuring the code or creating a structure that will hold that stuff, because that's a lot. But that's just, that's flavor, sorry, not function. But the functionality is you can return multiple values from a function. And Python is one of the few languages that do this, and it, it's really kind of neat. Okay, so let's go here. What's that? That's number of pennies. Uh, okay, swap, number of pennies, miles and minutes to miles, 533. Three. Okay, I think we're good. Unless anybody wants to, to see that one written out, we will go through the, um, the labs now. So here's the lab pseudocode. Lab 5.18, well, we're swapping values. So, and we did this before. Now, some people just kind of don't do this. The purpose of this is not to say, oh, I can return, you know, I can just swap them in return. There is a method to the madness, but the point of this is so that you take in two parameters and you return two parameters but what they want you to do is they want you to swap the values out of each of those parameters first. Um, and we're also starting to talk about the main function. Now, I don't really talk about it a lot here, but Zybooks does. The main function is defined differently. So what you'll see here is if underscore underscore name double equal sign open open single quote, underscore, underscore, main, underscore, underscore, close single quote. That is the way you define a main function in Python. And the main function just says start here. Usually when we've run a program, it just, at the first line it hits, it runs, then it hits another one, then it hits another one. It may branch, do a little branching. This actually is the starting place for Python. And it is something that, um, like I said, I don't talk a lot about in this one, in this lecture, 
but it is something good to read up on for Python. We don't necessarily have to have it in any of our um, in any of our labs or in any of our projects, but it's good to know about. So I want to swap and I've got two user inputs, user input one, user input two. I'm going to call swap values and I'm going to um, have two variables, output one and output two, that are going to be assigned to the two returns from the swap values function. So um, exact change. You have done this before. Okay, you did this in in um, module three. What we're doing here is we're changing it up a bit. So if you did really good on module three, perfect. If you didn't, go back and look at module three, see what kind of, um, of response you got and fix it and then put it in a function because that's what this is about. Okay, you've got the exact change function and here's where you're going to calculate your dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. And then you're going to return dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies to the caller of that function. And the second part is calling the function. So here I call, oops, sorry. Here I call the function. And I also get back the return values and then I use those values to decide what I'm going to print out. So you've done it in module three. Start with what you have and then augment it. So all the calculations go in the exact change function. You're then going to call the exact change function and then the rest of it is going to be the output. So you've got all of that. Just divide it up and make sure your indenting is, pos is correct. Um, and that's it. Oh yeah, this is only this this week we only have two labs and that's really good. So, does anybody have any questions? We can open up the um the audio if you want or you can type them into the chat if you have any questions. Going once. Going twice. Oh, well, sorry, Kaylin. I just saw that. Don't understand what the main function exactly is exactly from the labs. Can you give us advice on writing our pseudocode for get item function? Okay. So the main function is just a starting place. Most um, programming languages, you have to have a place to start. Python, because it is both a compiled and an interpreted language, simply runs based on the first line number it hits to run. So we haven't had to use a main function. But oftentimes, what we want to do as programmers is have more control. One of the ways to have more control over your program is to have a main function and say, this is where you start. OK, everything's under the main function. Everything then is defined. We have all these other functions defined. And we start here. That's what the main function is. Um, I don't think the labs require you to have a main function, but it's important to understand what it is. And a main function is, um, to Python, it is the start here. And it also helps you organize your code so that you're not necessarily leaving it up to Python for what line it hits first. Okay. So advice for writing your pseudocode for the get item function. So this is part of the project. And the question happens, how do you get an item? Now in your project that you're going to be turning in in week seven, when I play it, I'm going to get an item. I'm going to get an item again and again and again and again. So this is one of the, um, this is a piece of functionality that is perfect to be put into a function. 
So the question then is, how do we get an item? What's the process of getting an item when I'm in a program? I know how to get an item when I'm a human being. I go pick it up. You know, if there's an item on the floor that I want, I pick it up off the floor. But that doesn't work in Python. So we kind of have to go back and think about where the item is from a programmatic standpoint and how do we get it? How do we know that we have gotten an item? Well, our data structures next week are going to really help that along. But basically what you do is you have a list of items that you're going to get. And the get an item, okay, I can, I can do that. We can, uh, I'll open the room and we'll talk about it. Um, so for getting an item, you basically want to have a place to put it. And the items that, um, so let's go open the project and we'll talk about it. So let me go here and let's go here to week five. Um, that's a reflection. Requirements and rubric. So here's the rubric of the project. Um, you're creating a text-based game. And you, it's the simple dragon text game. And um, you're creating a storyboard. And then you're also going to write some pseudocode for a couple of things that you have to do. So your storyboard is, um, they give you templates. And you want to know what rooms you're going to have and how many items you will have, and who's the villain. So, <coughs> excuse me, this can be all kinds of different things. I've seen people do zombies. I've seen people find pets. I've seen people do Star Wars. Um, the, the program that you're going to have is what you're going to end up writing for week seven. Excuse me. Um, the Simple Dragon text game storyboard is a sample for a dragon themed game. But what you're creating is a storyboard for your game. So whatever your game is, whatever you've decided, and it doesn't have to be original. It could be a storyboard for a game that you currently play. Now, you're not going to want to make it massively complicated, but it can be a storyboard for something you're, you're used to playing. And then, um, and a storyboard is just a map. That's all it is. You're going to have eight rooms. You're going to be able to go north, south, east, or west. And um, when you go north, you're going to end up in a room. When you go south, you're going to end up in a room. Or maybe you're not allowed to go north and south. So that's the storyboard. Um, you have to be able to get to all the rooms. It's that simple. Um, so then you have the two functions. So you have to create pseudocode or a flowchart that outlines the step that you're going to move between rooms, and for you to get an item. So a lot of times when, when students first look at this, they're like, what in the world do you mean by move between rooms? Or what in the world do you mean by get an item? Because me as a human, I know what it means to move between rooms. I get up and I walk from the living room into the dining room. Then I've moved between rooms. But that can't work in Python. So what are we really doing here? Well, in Python, what we have to remember is that you have to start with the current position. Where is the player in the beginning? So if the player in the beginning is starting in the living room and moving to the dining room, how does that work? Well, 
it's actually a little easier in Python because I don't actually have to get up and move. All I have to do is set a variable to a new room. So if I am moving between rooms, I need a variable that is the current room and a variable that is going to, and a value that's going to be the next room. So let's do this really quick. I think I have something like this out there. What is that? That's not it. Um, let me see if I already have something out there real quick. Um, the lecture, that's the module. I don't know that I have my move between rooms example because I think they got upset with me when I um, when I gave too much away. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but let's do just a little exercise here. Let us, let me do this. I'm just going to create a new file. Um, new Python file. Hello. File. New Python file. So I'm just going to call it move. Okay. So let's say I have two rooms. Okay. I'm going to have rooms. And for right now, it's just going to be a list. And I'm going to have R1 in my list. And I'm going to have R2 in my list. And I can move to R1 and I can move to R2. But I need to start off with the concept of where I am. So my concept is going to be my current room. Actually, let me do this. Let me say living room and dining room. So my current room is going to be the living room. Let me take a drink. Hold on. <clears throat> my current room is going to be the living room. So I'm going to say current living room. Whoops. Excuse me. Actually, no, I'm going to say current room is rooms of zero. So I'm in the living room. So if I want to know where I am, I print current. And if I want to move to the next room, then I have to change current. Okay? So, I want to move, so I'm going to change current to rooms of two. Sorry, of one. And then I'm going to print, I'm in. Okay, let's just run this really quick to see what happens. Move. Okay? And this is pretty simple, so we all know what is going to happen. Okay? I have defined my rooms. I set my current room to 1, to the first value in rooms. So current is now living room. So I am in the living room. That's what that says. Because I've told it to say that, that's what it says. So I'm going to print on the console, I'm in living room. Now I want to move to the next room. So I'm going to move to the next room by setting it to the next room. So current rooms is going to be one. 
I'm saying current is rooms of one. So I am now in the dining room because I changed current. So that is how I moved between rooms. Now, there's a concept of a direction that we don't have yet. So I can, let's say, go up or down. So let me just finish this. It's done. I went from the living room to the dining room. So let's say I can go back and forth. So direction is going to be back or forth. Okay, so I can go back and forth between the two rooms. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change things a little bit. First, I'm going to define something called move. I'm just going to define move rooms. And that move rooms is going to be responsible for changing from the current room to the next room. So I am going to have current, I'm going to pass in the current room, and I'm going to pass in the direction. And for right now, I'm just going to define it as I can go from the living room to the dining room if I use the fourth command. And then I can go from the dining room to the living room if I use the back command. So I'm going to say if, here's where our if statement comes in, um, current is the same as rooms of zero. Actually, we're going to do fourth, so it makes it more sense. Fourth and back. And direction is actually that's not good, Lisa. Direct cur. Okay. So if cur and direct is directions of zero. of zero, then I'm going to return rooms of one. Else, if cur is rooms of one and all my writing in a different language and sorry and my bad I was writing in a different language there direct is direction of one then uh, again writing in a different language Lisa uh, curve. then I'm going to return rooms of one, sorry, of, two, of zero. Else, I am going to invalid, okay? So I have three things I can return. I'm going to return the living room, I'm going to return the dining room, or I'm going to return invalid. So now let's take a look. I don't need, so I now have to find my rooms in my direction. Down here I'm going to give it a place to start. So let's really give it a place to start. Let's go underscore, oh sorry, hold on. If, oh crap, I always have to remember. So there we go. Sorry, I always have to remember that syntax. For some reason, I've never been able to get the way to define a main in Python to stick in my head. Java, no problem. But Python, I can forget it. All right, so let's do this. If 
underscore underscore name equal let's get those right underscore underscore main whoops I can't type tonight if equals main colon I'm going to start I'm going to give it a place to start I'm going to say that I'm in current room and then let's do a little test if I say If I say current rooms is zero, and then I'm going to say pet val equals move rooms of um, cur current comma direction of zero and then I'm going to do this I'm going to print ret valve okay and I'm going to see what it says so let's just do that real quick so uh, I'm going to stop there now you'll notice I haven't stopped anywhere yet. Cut. Well, sorry, I have. I am defining my rooms. I'm defining my direction. I'm defining my move rooms. I come down here to main, and I'm now starting my program. So I've controlled where it starts. So I can encapsulate everything. So this is the main is a really good way of organizing stuff. So I'm going to set current rooms equal to zero, and now I'm going to say ret val equal move rooms, current, and direction. So I'm going to step in. So the current is a living room, and the direction is fourth. So if current rooms is zero and direct equal directions of zero, then my new current room is going to be one. And actually, I just realized I made a mistake. So I'm just going to set current that's what I wanted to do current so I've changed the current room by calling move rooms so let's do it again so I've defined my rooms I've defined my direction I've defined what my move rooms looks like I am now in my main uh, in in the main part of my program I have defined the start place I've said current rooms is zero first place I'm going to be so if the first place you're going to be in the game is in the great hall then you will define your current room as your great hall if it's going to be in the dungeon then you define it as the dungeon it's your starting place when you plunk a new game player down into your game where do you want them to start so now I'm going to call move rooms. So you'll notice that I'm changing the value of current when I move rooms. And I have to tell it where I start, which is my current room, and, wh how I'm, and what direction I'm taking. So I'm going to step in. I'm up here in move rooms. My direction, sorry, my current room is living room, and my direction is fourth. So can I move from the living room for, so I'm moving, yeah, from the living room into the dining room? Yes, I can. So I am going to return. So I have now set current equals the dining room, and I am in the dining room. Okay, that's fine. So let's write a little test, okay? So I'm going to say for val in rooms and I'm going to say for dir in direction and then I'm going to do that I'm going to say if current is equal to invalid Uh, 
that. Don't change current. So we're just writing a little program here to test whether or not move rooms works right because I should only be able to move forth from the living room to the dining room and I should only be able to move back from the dining room to the living room. So basically what I'm doing is I'm just going to do a for loop through rooms and a for loop through direction and see what happens. So if my return value is invalid, I'm going to print invalid, but I haven't changed the current room only want to change the current room if I have made a valid move. So now I'm going to say else current is rec val. And then I'm going to print that. So let's see, did I make any problems? Let's stir shadow direct. Okay, that won't do that. Sorry, am I am I going off on a tangent? Yes, this will all be posted on YouTube tomorrow. I will finish this and then we will finish this up. So this should be fine. And this is just a test program. This isn't necessarily what like your gameplay loop will look like, but I'm trying to give you the concepts that you're going to need to know what a current room is, and to know how to move between rooms. So let's just run this really quick and see what happens, or debug it really quick. So I have set my current room. My current room is now the living room. So I'm going to sort for val in rooms. So I'm in the living room. My first val is living room. For direct in directions. Can I move from the living room forth to the dining room? If I step in, yes, I can. Retval is invalid. It is not. So I'm going to set my new room is now the dining room, and I'm going to print it. Okay. So I'm in. An, I'm in a. a um, I'm doing an an inner loop. So now I'm going to go to the next direction. So my Val in rooms is still on zero. So I'm now going to see if I can move back from, yes. Uh, you, you, in, Todd, in terms of your game, you really do need to be able to use north, south, east, and west. So you're going to have to have more like a, you're going to have to have not a straight line because you've got four directions you have to use. You don't have to use four directions for every single room, but you do have to use all four directions. So let's go back and finish that. Okay. All right. So we are in the living room and we're going to try and go back. So what's going to happen? I'm in the living, uh, sorry, I'm in the dining room, and I'm trying to go f forth. The current is dining room, and I'm trying to go forth, sorry. And I cannot go forth from the dining room. So I'm going to print invalid. My ret val is invalid. I'm going to print invalid, and I'm not going to change whatever my current room is, and my current room is the dining room. So I'm up here. I've done everything I can. So now I'm changing to my val is dining room. Oh, that's what I did wrong. Sorry. This should be val to do the test. Is that what I want? That's what I want to do the test. So. I'm just going to run this so we don't have to do. So I'm in the dining room. I'm in the dining room. Invalid, invalid. Okay. I'm in. 
Sorry about that. This is what happens sometimes when I just program. Current equal rep pal. Now I was right before. Sorry. It's too late for my brain. I apologize changing things. Okay. So anyway, this is the concept of what you have to do to move between rooms. Okay. This stuff is just testing it. But this is the concept you have to have. You have a current, you have where you are and a direction. So is the direction valid? Can you get from your current room using the direction to the next room? So if you have north, south, east, and west, your directions are going to be north, south, east, and west. If you have eight rooms, you're going to have eight rooms there. And you're going to have to marry the rooms and their direction. And we'll learn a little bit more about how to do that next week when we start talking about dictionaries. But this is the concept of moving between rooms. You don't have to have everything defined because it's pseudocode. You have to know that you're in a current place and you have a direction. And there could be checks that would cause this to be invalid, like the direction is invalid. And then you take the direction and let it tell you what the next current room is. Does that help some of this? OK, good. So it's late. Does anybody have any other questions before we uh, I stop the recording and stop sharing? Okay, good, Trace. I'm glad. So I'm going to stop everything now. I, I, I believe that my, um, my issues with free conference call are taken care of. And so this should be up on the YouTube channel tomorrow. Everybody have a really good evening.